Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening to the more than 570 friends and colleagues that are joining us today from around the world. I'm Mike Sfrega. I'm the director of the Polar Institute at the Wilson Center, and I'm so pleased that you can join us today for what I believe to be a very important and it most likely will be a very informative discussion for most of you who either follow these issues or those who don't seem to follow them on a day-to-day -day basis. This is the Polar Institute Arctic Domain Awareness Center Arctic Security Dialogues for progress on the Department of the Air Force Arctic strategy. I wanna thank my colleague, retired Air Force Major General Randy Church Key, the Executive Director of the Arctic Domain Awareness Center in Anchorage, Alaska, for his outstanding partnership of this endeavor. And from the Wilson Center, I wanna thank my colleagues at the Canada Institute and the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States for their continued support. And as always, the leadership of Laguna Corporation and the community members of the Alaska Village of Wainwright for their foundational and continued support of our programs and all of our initiatives. I am very pleased to have joining us today the President, Director, and CEO of the Wilson Center, Ambassador Mark Green. Prior to joining the Wilson Center, Ambassador Green served as Executive Director of the McCain Institute, Administrator of the U.S. Agency for International Development. He also served as President of the International Republican Institute president and CEO of the Initiative for Global Development and senior director at the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition. Ambassador Green served as the U.S. Ambassador to Tanzania from mid-2007 to 2009. Before that, he served four terms in the U.S. House of Representatives representing Wisconsin's 8th District. Mr. Ambassador, Mark, thank you for joining us. I turn over the program to you. Great. Uh, thanks, Mike, and uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Well, I, I don't need to tell you, but the Arctic landscape is changing dramatically in the literal sense, of course, but also in the geopolitical sense. The world's great awakening to the Arctic offers real promise for economic development and cooperation on shared challenges. But it also comes with the possibility of conflict. Russia, we know, derives a significant portion of its GDP from natural resource development in the Arctic. It's also continuing to expand its military presence and capabilities in the region. China, which sometimes forgets that it's not actually an Arctic state, is doing everything it can to establish its own influence in Arctic governance and economic development. In the present, to be sure, but especially with an eye towards shaping Arctic development in coming decades. While there's no imminent threat of conflict in the Arctic, the increasing activity and proximity of these aggressive powers requires the U.S. to maintain situational awareness and operational capacity. The U.S. armed forces must be prepared to defend U.S. interests in the Arctic. To accomplish this mission, one year ago, the Department of the Air Force released their Arctic strategy. Appropriately entitled, ensuring a stable Arctic through vigilance, power projection, cooperation, and preparation. This strategy outlines the Air Force goals, objectives, and concerns in the Arctic, and its plan to protect U.S. interests. But, you know, strategies too often sit on shelves. In order for this strategy to be effective, to bring us from aspiration to performance, from mission goals to mission success, from thinking about preparing for the unknown to actually being prepared for the unknown, this strategy must be implemented. The U.S. Armed Forces know full well the importance of understanding the various environments in which they serve. The U.S. must be prepared to operate in the Arctic, which is not immune to conflict, and work with allies and partners to protect our rights and freedoms, the rule of law, and international norms. And that's why today's program is so important. This distinguished panel of leaders will help us learn more, more about the actions of the Air and Space Force and what they've taken, steps they've taken to implement their one-year-old strategy, and why the U.S., as well as partners and allies, are better prepared today to operate in the Arctic than we were just one year ago. The Wilson Center is truly honored to host this event. It reinforces the Polar Institute's position as a leading global forum for Arctic issues and foreign policy. This discussion builds upon past editions of the Arctic Security Dialogue series. 
It builds upon the February 2021 symposium in which the Arctic ambassadors from Japan, China, and South Korea discuss their strategies, their country's Arctic strategies. The Polar Institute also hosted over a dozen programs directly linked to Iceland's recent chairmanship of the Arctic Council. Suffice to say, we truly appreciate the U.S. Air Force coming to the Wilson Center to discuss their important Arctic strategy and its practical and policy implications for the U.S. partners and the citizens of the North. I want to thank Undersecretary Kelly Seabolt of International Affairs for the Air Force, Lieutenant General Clinton Highnote, Deputy Chief of Staff for Strategy, Integration and Requirements at the U.S. Air Force, and Lieutenant General William Lecury, Deputy Chief of Space Operations, Strategy, Plans, Programs and Requirements and Analysis at the U.S. Space Force. I want to thank all of them for their willingness to speak with us today to share their insights and the strategy. And lastly, I want to thank the audience for joining the Wilson Center today for what I know will be a timely and important discussion. With that, uh, Mike, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Mark, for your opening comments. This set a, a great foundation for this discussion. Let me now uh, let uh, General Church Key share some of his thoughts before we go to the panel discussion. Church? Uh, Mike, thank you. And I'd like to also echo, first of all, congratulations, Ambassador Green, for, for your leadership role that you're providing to the Wilson Center and to the distinguished colleagues from the Department of the Air Force, from both at the Secretary level and the Headquarters Air Force at, uh, and Headquarters Space Force. Strategically, we're in a spot now where the Air Force has been one year underway in, uh, in executing and uh, implementing its Arctic strategy. We, of course, uh, note that the, the Department of Defense released a strategy for the Arctic in 2019 that was intended to do three major line of activities, uh, line of activities defending the homeland, compete when necessary to maintain favorable regional balance of the power, and ensure common domains remain free and open. The Air Force uh, has been pursuing four lines of activity under this Arctic strategy they released last August to prosecute vigilance all domains, projecting power through a credible combat force, cooperation with allies and partners, which is critical across the region, and then of course preparing for Arctic operations. Those range from the, the hand of help uh, for search and rescue humanitarian assistance and disaster response to the clenched fist to resolve, to be able to defend and, uh, and secure our national interests in this region. The Arctic Man Awareness Center is privileged to support uh, this activity. We're privileged to partner with Mike and this, and Dr. Schrager with uh, as well the Wilson team for this fourth of our Arctic security dialogues. And we look forward to this conversation. Thanks for joining us, folks. And I give the floor back to you, uh, Dr. Schrager. Thank you, Church, for your comments. So now let's have the program begin. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to have this panel with us today. As uh, Ambassador Green noted, we have with us Ms. Kelly Seabolt, Deputy Undersecretary of the Air Force, Lieutenant General uh, Clinton Hynote, Deputy Chief of Staff for Strategy, Integration and Requirements, the Headquarters of the U.S. Air Force, and Lieutenant General William McCurry, Deputy Chief of Space Operations, Strategy, Plans, Programs, Requirements, and Analysis at the United States Space Force. So let us begin, and I will uh, turn this program over to uh, Secretary Seabolt for her opening comments. Secretary? All right. Uh, well, thanks very much um, for the introduction and for hosting us today. Uh, to you and everyone else at the Wilson Center, um, thank you for your important contributions to our national security. Your research and expertise have informed US policy for decades, and we certainly appreciate the opportunity to discuss the Department of the Air Force's Arctic strategy with your institution and with all those that are joining us today. It's also a pleasure to be joined by um, Bill and Q, my colleagues from A5 and S5, plus a lot of other uh, numbers, especially for, for both of them actually. Um, successful implementation of our strategy really requires a total force effort um, under the Department of the Air Force and our two services. And I'm certainly proud of the work that our teams are doing together to defend uh, US and allied interests in the high north. Um, last week uh, marked the one year anniversary of our strategy, which supports a secure and stable Arctic where our national interests are safeguarded, the homeland is protected, and nations address shared challenges cooperatively. Now, over the past 12 months, we have made progress against those four lines of effort that you just mentioned, domain vigilance, power projection, 
cooperation with allies and partners and improving our preparation for Arctic operations. Advancing these objectives builds readiness and furthers our national security interests at a time when the Arctic is a region of growing strategic importance and intensifying geopolitical competition. Much of this competition is accelerated by climate change, which has increased physical access and fueled an escalation of activity and ambition in the region. Fortunately, as we respond and adapt to these changing conditions, we have something that our competitors do not a network of strong defense relationships with six of the seven other Arctic nations providing key strategic advantages. Besides holding vast experience in high latitude operations, our Arctic allies and partners have developed concepts, tactics, techniques, and procedures from which our airmen and guardians can greatly benefit. At Secretary of the Air Force for International Affairs, where our mission is security cooperation, we are heavily focused on further strengthening those relationships in the air and space domain, domains. And we are doing that by enhancing combined exercises, deepening interoperability, and expanding collaborative planning opportunities, all while staying engaged at the senior most levels. Thank you, and I look forward to discussing those activities and other ways that we can work on upholding a rules-based order in the Arctic alongside our allies and partners. And I will pass it off to my colleague, Q Hino. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you so much for allowing us the opportunity to talk with the Wilson Center today and Ambassador Green, Dr. Strega, and Major General Key. Thank you for your partnership in, uh, in helping us talk uh, through these key issues about the Arctic. And, uh, and I get a chance to lead a great team here on the Air Staff called Air Force Futures. And our job is to look and see what are the strategic threats that are out there, how do we uh, adapt to those threats and we use things like wargaming, modeling and simulation and other forms of analysis to do that. And we've been doing that with the Arctic and we found something very interesting. And that is that, uh, that we're not nearly as, uh, as secure and safe as we may be thinking we are, especially in the avenues of approaches over the Arctic. And we can talk more about that, but that has led to a major shift in our wargaming, and I, I, I do think we'll have the, uh, the opportunity to talk about that more. You know, the Arctic is the shortest route between our competitors and us, and coming through the air, coming through the space, in essence, the aerospace uh, avenues of approaches are things that we must be concerned about. And we've known this because, you know, the Air Force isn't new to the Arctic. We've been in the Arctic for some time from uh, defending the Aleutian Islands during World War II, and then, of course, monitoring the northern approaches throughout the Cold War and beyond. We're doing it right now. Uh, but but our, uh, our, our use of the Arctic as a strategic buffer is eroding for all the reasons that have already been talked about, uh, especially climate change, and especially with some of the activities that we see Russia and China engaging in. So, we, uh, we absolutely believe that this is going to continue to grow in importance. And of course, the Department of the Air Force uh, devotes almost 80% of the overall Department of Defense's resources to the, uh, to the Arctic. So we're, we're up there with some, some amount of, uh, of real uh, capability. And that's an important part, the homeland defense and, and the way that we're thinking through what homeland defense looks like in our day and age and in a time when great power war is a possibility and certainly not something that we want. So as we've gone through our war gaming and our analysis, we've seen some really important things. Now, I'll go ahead and whet everybody's appetite to one uh, because I think it's, uh, it's a really important insight. That is that um, the, our first line of effort is domain vigilance. And what we have seen is awareness about what is going on in the spaces we call the high north or the Arctic is a key part of preserving peace. We have found that none of the countries that routinely operate in the Arctic want war. Uh, and in fact, they, they continually choose paths that will get to competition but not conflict if we know what's going on. The, the times when we have seen in our workups for, uh, in our gaming and in our simulations, where we've seen conflict erupt is when one side is doing something that, that somebody else is not aware of. And so this gets into the importance of awareness 
in the Arctic as being one of the most important things that can happen for peacekeeping. And I hope we get a chance to talk about that more as we go through. But we're excited about this strategy. We've, we're excited about all the work that has been going into it and implementing it for the past year. We've got a lot more to go. This is a lifetime uh, effort for us. But, uh, but we've made a lot of progress in a short amount of time. Looking forward to talking more with you about that. So thanks again and appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk about this. And I'll, uh, I'll add my thanks to the Wilson Center, the Arctic Command Awareness Center, uh, and all of you for the opportunity to talk with you today um, about the importance of the Arctic to the Department of the Air Force, both services. Um, you know, our Space Force team works very closely with um, Secretary Seabolt's team on the international affairs side and with my counterpart, General Hynote's team, um, working strategy issues. And it's always a pleasure to join them on the stage, either virtually or in person um, as we do this. I, I think it's uh, um, very interesting timing and probably worth pointing out because I'm sure many are dialing in from Alaska. So I'll just offer congratulations on your new gold medalist from last night. Um, what an exciting uh, swim race that was and very cool and just uh, ironic timing for us that we're going to be talking uh, Alaska and the Arctic uh, a day after that happened. So pretty, pretty fun event last night to watch. Um, you know, I think it's kind of interesting, actually, if you uh, take a look at the parallels between the Arctic region and the space region or the space domain. Um, you know, in both cases, we certainly have increased activity uh, over the last several years. Uh, um, in both cases, we have very challenging operating environments um, characterized by uh, adversaries and competitors that have the potential to alter security and the peaceful dynamics in both of these regions. Uh, and so th those parallels, I think, are, are illustrative as we begin to have these conversations today. You know, ultimately, the Space Force was established to preserve freedom of action in our region, the space area of responsibility, 100 kilometers and up uh, on orbit, and to enable joint force lethality and effectiveness. And it's that uh, joint force lethality and effectiveness uh, and ability to deter in many regions, but certainly in the Arctic region, uh, that makes uh, many of our capabilities pertinent to this discussion and to our Department of the Air Force Arctic strategy. Um, those capabilities are tailor-made to support uh, a region where there's sparse ground infrastructure, as, as many of you are aware uh, who live there on a daily basis. Our capabilities ultimately help augment the joint force uh, as they operate in this region. Things range from communications to position navigation and timing uh, to imagery. All of those capabilities certainly enable our joint force operations in that region. Communications are certainly critical to a region that has uh, limited ground infrastructure for communications. Um, imagery uh, and position navigation and timing certainly help the joint force uh, as they prepare for uh, crisis or emergency response, uh, allowing us to be able to, um, to General Hynote's point, uh, maintain awareness uh, of what's going on in the region. Um, and then be able to help us reallocate or surge assets uh, for the joint force. Um, the, all, all of those space capabilities are a key piece of enabling us to do that. Search and rescue, another uh, area where space capabilities contribute uh, greatly, certainly in the Arctic region. And then lastly, we have our own ground assets that are in the region as well. Uh, those that uh, follow closely uh, will know that uh, the, the recently renamed Clear Space Force Station, uh, as well as Thule Air Base, have been uh, on the ground there in the Arctic for a long time, providing um, missile warning and space surveillance capabilities, as well as a little bit of satellite command and control up there at Thule Air Base in Greenland. So again, the capabilities we have uh, are certainly there to support the joint force in this uh, unique region of the Arctic, and they also help us do our business uh, uh, better as well. And so with that, I'll, I'll pause there and, and look forward to the conversation and the questions. It should be a great event. Yeah, th thank you very much, all, all three of you, for uh, providing really good foundational discussion points and a lot of areas that we can we can now cover. So let me let me just begin with a with a couple of rounds of of, of questions here, and then I'm going to invite my uh, colleague Church Keith to, to add in uh, his thoughts. Uh, and we're also getting some questions in from the audience. So let me remind folks that they can send in their audio their in their comments to us or their questions at polar at wilsoncenter.org, polar at wilsoncenter.org. And we'll do our very best to get your questions uh, into the audience, uh, into the panel. 
Well, let me let me start with uh, Lieutenant General High Note. Uh, you, you mentioned a whole number of things that we can dig down on, but let me ask you this first. Uh, from from your side, uh, your, your perspective, uh, was there any particular rationale? I'm going back to the beginning of the announcement of the strategy. Any particular rationale for the timing of the strategy's release? Many of our uh, military uh, branches of service were releasing uh, uh, strategies. What, what about the timing? Anything in that <clears throat> that would either reflect where the Air Force was going or what the Air Force was doing, but the compelling issues to them presented to the public? Can you give us some insight on that? And then sure. I do want, and and, I do want and to actually, support. that's a that's a fairly straightforward question to ask. So we use strategies to focus on the most important things. So in this particular case, uh, we see the Arctic situation changing. There were two major changes that uh, that we uh, acknowledged in our strategy, and that we've got to think about, uh, assess and adjust uh, the way that we approach things. So the first is, is, is it's becoming easier to operate in the Arctic because a lot of stuff is melting. And because, uh, because of that, you see that the, uh, the, the ability to get up there and do things of importance is increasing. Uh, our, our Secretary of Defense said, as the Arctic melts, competition for resources and influence in the region increase. And of course, that's true. And, and uh, so not only is there, uh, is, is there a warming trend, but that's allowing more activity. Now, interestingly, that all that activity is not benign. Uh, so uh, as an example, last year, uh, we intercepted more Russian uh, military flights near Alaska than we have ever since the Cold War. So there is now a trend, not only of competition, but of competition in the military realm. And because of that, that, that change, that, that, that is what drove our, uh, our uh, focus on the Arctic and the release of a strategy. Uh, and and as, the, uh, as we implement the strategy, what we expect is that that focus continues to allow the United States to compete well also in, uh, in, in uh, relationship to our allies and partners, but also if necessary to push back on some of the military competition that has been occurring in the Arctic. Thanks. Thank you for the, for the response to that. Uh, let, let me follow up on that with uh, bringing in uh, General Likiri into this. Uh, General High Note noted uh, that we've gone from or the Arctic and Alaska has gone from a strategic buffer, right? And now the insinuation is that it's no longer a strategic buffer. It's, it's actually in the game. It is part of a broader global geopolitical uh, geostrategic area versus just a buffer. So to that end, uh, you know, the, the strategy is analyzed by folks from think tanks and the academic community and, and others. But can, can you give us an update from your perspective on from the Space Force on, on maybe some specifics without going into uh, in depth, can you give us some idea of the work you've done to implement the strategy, uh, knowing full well what the background is for having the strategy? Sure, it's a, it's a great question and, and I agree completely with uh, uh, Q's characterization of the timing. Uh, the interesting thing for us is obviously we were kind of in our uh, first year as a new service uh, as we were uh, discussing this, and it only made sense for us to publish this as a Department of the Air Force strategy involving both services um, because of the capabilities that each bring to the table. So to the point of your question on, on uh, implementing a strategy, those of us that that write them um, on a regular basis know it's it's equally, if not more important, to implement them after you've uh, after you've drafted them. So um, many things going on here since the strategy was published um, in in our world. Um, we've certainly continued to spend uh, millions of dollars uh, on continuing maintenance and software upgrades for um, some of those missile warning, missile defense uh, radars that I mentioned that are in the region. Um, spent uh, several hundred millions of dollars working on improving communications uh, in the region. And, and I can talk to those in more specifics later if there's follow on questions there, but to, but to keep this at a high level um, for your question. And then uh, also continuing to explore environmental monitoring capabilities that space can provide here, because obviously that's a, as Q highlighted, you know, one of the main reasons for this strategy is that the environment has changed and then opened up operations in that, or the ability to operate 
operate in that region. And so there are space capabilities that we offer today with our current Defense Meteorological Support Program satellites that do environmental monitoring there. And then we're working towards some follow-on systems as well. And again, we can talk to those uh, in more depth, but uh, absolutely, um, each of the space capabilities that we have uh, that orbit that region are providing critical capability. And we know that we'll need to continue that. Um, and it will become even more important as uh, operations continue to grow in that area. Thanks for that, that response. And those are uh, other, other issues we'd like, we'd like to get to. Uh, Secretary Siebold, may, may I bring you into this conversation now? Uh, how does the department strategy look to improve cooperation and coordination with our allies. It's been mentioned here already. Uh, we note that that is a pretty substantive part of the strategy, but are there allies that are particularly important to the department when thinking about uh, operating in the Arctic? I think all of our, our partners, um, our Arctic friendly air forces shall we say it's important for, but, but even beyond that, um, I know that the Italians have, um, as part of NATO uh, efforts, have deployed up to Iceland with their F-35s. They've they've done activities in that region as well. But I think um, our starting point is <clears throat> going to be a meeting that we're going to have in September among the Arctic Air Forces. I say Air Forces, quote unquote, because there are also many of them are also responsible for space within their um, within their uh, force structure. So we're going to have a meeting um, then to start really looking at areas that we can enhance collaboration. I mean, we already have 62 bilateral agreements with Arctic partners that cut across space sharing, research, test, um, defense procurement and exchanges, um, other, other agreements that have already been done. And I don't want to steal Bill's thunder, but we had a part in this was, you know, looking at working with uh, partners to increase, as he said, environmental monitoring in the region and communications. Um, it's difficult to get, um, you know, great coverage of SATCOM in the high north or in, you know, down in Antarctica as well. And um, so uh, we take an advantage of working with uh, Norway that had satellites that were going to be launched in the right orbit that allowed us to get our capability up quicker uh, to add uh, the better communications in the high north um, by putting uh, payloads on those two Norwegian satellites, um, which will help us get better comms uh, up into the region. So those are areas, um, you know, where we've already done collaboration. I think there's more opportunities, particularly with um, Canada uh, and, uh, you know, Norway, Sweden, Finland, who all have interest in the region. And of course, Denmark um, with their responsibilities uh, for Greenland. So I think um, there's a tremendous opportunity to do more Certainly, um, I spent five years <laughs> with the Coast Guard and we had an Arctic strategy and we had an Arctic Coast Guard forum. So I think it's possible that we could end up with something along those lines with our Arctic partners and really look at sharing lessons learned, um, how best to operate. And then of course, um, we're also doing exercises with these partners, which is really important as well. Thank you for that. Uh, Church, fair warning, I'd like to bring you into the discussion now. I know you've got a couple of questions to ask, and then I, I have another round uh, for, for our panelists just to pull on some of the themes that they've already uh, discovered. And, I, and, and just as, as Alaskans Church, and I may have a question or two about Alaska, particularly since I'm here in Fairbanks, I may want to bring up uh, Eielson and, and uh, Clear and Anderson and missile defense as well. So fair warning to our, our panel speakers as well. Church, let me turn it over to you for a couple of questions. Great. Well, thank you, Mike. And uh, Under Secretary Seabolt, uh, first of all, I'd like to pull that thread a little further forward from your last remark. Uh, knowing that the implementation of a, of a strategy has a great tie into items that are uh, implementing in, in terms of interoperability, increased proficiency to respond, et cetera, for the full range of missions uh, that the Air Force, uh, Department of the Air Force can anticipate in the Arctic. So in this aspect, <clears throat> when you look at uh, as the strategy continues to be implemented, is there, an, is there an increased exercise regime with international partners tied to the strategy? And then what can we expect for more sustained operations in the region? Your thoughts? Um, I think on the operations side, I might, I might throw that over to my colleagues. I mean, the Space Force is always operating in the region, but also we're increasing obviously up in Alaska with F-35s and, and other capabilities. Um, 
But combined exercises are really important, I think, in particular with, with these partners. All of these partners are not NATO partners, but um, they're important partners nonetheless. And we have shared values and, and we work with them regularly. So um, doing exercises um, with them is, is important. And we've already done some. I mean, just uh, last month in June, we executed the Arctic Challenge exercise, which brought together the US, Sweden, Norway, and Denmark and Finland one of our largest uh, tactical air exercises. I mean, it notably featured, you know, the F-35s, uh, Norway's for the first time. And that allows all of us to get important lessons learned on um, how that aircraft is operating in the high north. It would be important for all of us. Um, we also, um, again, under, uh, we've had uh, Secretary Roth and the Ministers of Defense of the Four Arctic Nations um, signed a letter of intent in February demonstrating continued support for Arctic Challenge exercises and directly advancing the strategy. Um, and, you know, and certainly um, our non-NATO uh, allies and partners are, are very interested in, in continuing to work together as we all worry about um, the challenges that, that we're all gonna face in that region and already are to a large degree. So um, we've also done some uh, training with Canadian partners in air defense exercise amalgam DART. Um, and this month we just participated in air policing missions over Iceland in support of our NATO alliance commitments. And as I mentioned, Iceland is our, um, the Italians have also done that. So, um, you know, as, as there's more activity and changing landscape, it's more important than ever that we operate uh, together in this environment that, that we learn how to do it better and improve how we work together, um, not as a single force, but alongside our allies and partners. And um, so exercises are really critical um, for, for this area, uh, for us all to be prepared and, and to prevent conflict from starting or extending into the Arctic, which I think is what we, what we all have as a shared goal. Madam Secretary, that's, that's an outstanding set of reflections. I thank you for that. Uh, before I can pull the threads further forward here, in the interest of time, I'm going to hold on that for a second because we have a few more questions to get to, but I, if we have time allows, I'd like to circle back on some aspects that, that you just so well pre presented to us. I thank you for that. I want to pivot quickly to Lieutenant General on high note. Uh, you, you, in your opening reflections, you made some remarks regarding uh, war gaming uh, simulations to try to sense out uh, how the strategy will be implemented, what some of the, the uh, implications of, of, of that Arctic strategy is rolls out across the Department of the Air Force to include, of course, the Air Force side that you are, serve as the A-5 there at headquarters. I um, understand that the Air Force is looking to put together a series of war games, uh, some of which, of course, may be with allies and partners that are focused in the Arctic region. Uh, can you talk about some of that work and, and some of the initial uh, results that you may be seeing? I know you touched a little bit of this at the very beginning, but I'd like to kind of pull that thread a little bit further forward. And uh, Joe, your, your reflection, sir. Yeah, Church, thank you for the, for the question. And uh, the, the, the short answer is yes. We have pivoted our focus for our wargaming efforts at the, what we would call the Title 10 level, the service level war games. Uh, we had been spending a lot of wargaming uh, bandwidth on uh, countering great powers in uh, specifically in Europe and in the Asia Pacific. And one of the things that we felt like we did not understand as well were how that competition would, would spill over into the Arctic, how our competitors could use the Arctic in, in a, uh, in a way of doing something strategically bad for the United States and for our allies and partners. And so we felt like we needed to understand that better. And so that allowed us to pivot. And we've got four series of war games. Each one has a different flavor. Uh, we have a, a war, a, the, the two that we're engaged in right now, Arctic Engagement and Plan Blue, uh, they're involving our allies and partners. And what we're trying to do is understand the nature of the competition as well as the, uh, the, the range of capabilities that each of us bring to the problem. And if uh, the first problem is understanding what is going on in the Arctic and what others are doing, then uh, shared awareness becomes something that is a very interesting, uh, a, a both objective and technological challenge for us. And so, what we are seeing, and, and this builds on uh, quite a bit of the wargaming that we've done up to this point, 
is that the, the information about what is going on in the Arctic is actually a form of sovereignty for ourselves, our allies and partners. And, uh, and in so many ways, we can fortify each other's sovereignty by sharing that information. And so there is a, a, a very much a shared interest that we have with, uh, with the Arctic nations and being able to talk about, to share, to understand what is really going on. That again gets after that first line of effort in our strategy. So after that, we're gonna go into what we call global engagement uh, and then uh, features game. And normally we use both of those, but especially features game is an experimental game. So we try different technologies and concepts. We never just throw a technology at something and expect it to work. There's a, there's a whole host of interrelated concept and, and technology work that happens. I believe that Wargaming is one of the great focusing events that we can bring to the craft of, uh, of strategy and concept development. It really focuses everybody's attention in a way that I've, I, you know, because everybody wants to win. Uh, and so, uh, so, er, er, so everybody focuses really hard and they bring the best analysis that they know of and the, and the best data and some of the best ideas and we knit those together in an experiment. So what we are trying to do with this series of four games is understand what is, you know, what the dynamics are in the Arctic region and also bring an innovative approach to what it looks like to have awareness and defense in the Arctic. And that's going to be a layered thing. Uh, and it, uh, it will probably involve a significant amount of, uh, uh, of data analytics, uh, of new technologies that allow for shared awareness, of common command and control. Sometimes we call that joint all domain command and control or JADC2. And, and then of course the air and space capabilities that you need to be able to defend. So all of those are gonna come into play. Uh, I, I'm really looking forward to the recipe that comes together out of all these war games. And when that happens, my objective will be to share that as openly as possible, just like we've done with our other Wargaming series. So th again, thank you for the question. Sure, I know that was an outstanding set of reflections. Um, truly, you're, you're leveraging the power of war game and simulation uh, to maximum benefit and we're able to apply those, those, what I call methodologies to understanding and characterizing the problem set that you face in the full range of, of missions that you can anticipate in the Arctic. And I appreciate those reflections. I just kind of wish right now, Mike, that we had about an hour and a half more to go here, but I'm gonna have to flip the, the, the floor back to you uh, for a couple further questions. But General Heino, thank you for that. I'd like to maybe, if we get some time to come pull that a little bit further forward, but we'll see how much more time we have available before I do so. Mike, I give the floor back to you. And thank you, Ken General, much appreciated. Thank you, Church. It's, it's clear to me, so this is an open invite to the from you know with the world watching is that uh, let's do this again. There, there is a robust list of questions from a global audience to the three of you. So this just tells me that this is not only an important issue, there are a lot of questions, good questions, about not just the Air Force strategy, but how it relates to the other branches of service, uh, awareness for cooperation while defending the nation and the homeland. Uh, so I, I think we are compelled to look at a time in the future maybe not too long from now to do this again. So that's an open invitation, uh, Secretary Seabolt, to see if we can't coordinate something at, at the right time. Uh, we certainly have the right places to do so. Let me follow up on a couple of things before I go to the audience's question. The issue of uh, under, General Hynote and Curry, you both noted that there is now an understanding and appreciation for uh, the Arctic, right? Not just a place over there somewhere, not just on a weather map next to Hawaii, not just an, an also ram that's now an integrated part of, of the way in which our nation needs to think and plan for and then uh, act upon. So let me ask you this question. Just this weekend, we had the pleasure of hosting uh, Secretary Austin here in the state of Alaska, certainly in Fairbanks at Ielson Air Force Base. And he made uh, some some comments that really highlighted the new role of the Arctic. And he used the lens of the Indo-Pacific region, right? Thinking about this arc of concern that runs from the South China Sea, South Pacific, North Pacific, Bering Sea, Bering Strait, right up into the, the Arctic 
especially that gap between Alaska and, and, and the Russian Federation. So I'd like your thoughts about the ways in which all three of you, may, and Secretary Siebel, perhaps I can ask you, since you work with our international partners, how has the way in which we have visualized the map, right? Not just a flat map anymore. How have we, how has the ways that we have visualized this map changed for the Air Force? And, and how are we working with partners that perhaps aren't partners from the North? If there are other partners around the world that now are a part of the way in which we have to think, act, plan for, and then enable. That's a, I think that's a really good question. I think um, when you look at the map from a flat perspective, you obviously see that, that there are threat vectors that can be exploited um, through the Arctic region. And this, this only increases, of course, with climate change and uh, environmental changes in the Arctic. Um, you know, you're going <laughs> to, when I was at Coast, cruise ship went through the, you know, Arctic waters for the first time. I mean, so there's definitely increasing activity, not just tourists, but it, it provides the opportunity for malign actors uh, to do more in the region. I think the other thing to think about too is that um, while very different regions um, geostrategically, there are some common areas with other partners um, who care a great deal about the Antarctic, um, including Pacific nations such as Chile. So it gives us you know, another opportunity to talk to uh, partners about the kinds of things that we could do to increase our capabilities because you could leverage um, capabilities both in the high north or in, or in the Antarctic. So I think that's another um, area that it uh, provides another opportunity as we talk to our international partners. Um, but I mean, the bottom line is as, as you look at the map, you can see the, the, the vectors by which um, things can happen. I think, um, you know, it's clear that that some of our strategic, um, you know, competition competitors are um, increasing their presence in the region. Some of that may be, um, I don't think it's irrational, uh, you know, in some ways for certainly for Russia to be doing that, given that, you know, they largely rely on um, oil and gas uh, for for funding their economy and and so they have a very strong strategic re, uh, um, interest in trying to get um, the gas out of the Yamal P Peninsula um, out uh, to places uh, where they can sell it so I think there's some some of that um, but then we also see this sort of you know as noted at the beginning this kind of mind-boggling statement that China, you know, put out several years ago that they're a near Arctic nation, which is, if I look at the map from above, I don't see that, but they're certainly moving to legitimize a role in the region as they um, continue with their One Belt Road, One Road initiatives, the, the um, polar, uh, you know, Silk Road initiatives. Um, things of that nature to try to legitimize a role in the Arctic. And frankly, this is an area where we probably need to be working <laughs> with all of the Arctic nations to ensure that our common interests are protected. Um, but I don't know if I answered the question <laughs> that well, but um, certainly there's, there's a lot happening um, in terms of strategic competition. Um, and I think that that's something that we have to be prepared for. Uh, but those countries that have the strongest interest in the Arctic, and in particular our allies, that's where I think we need to focus our attention. But again, uh, all of NATO has an interest, you know, as the alliance in the region, um, because again, it's an area that could become a problem um, for, for all of us um, with Article 5, should anything ever happen. Dr. Schrager, could I build on that? Please. Yeah, so so just I, I'm, I'll take that overall uh, look and then narrow down a little bit on military power, uh, because I think it's important that uh, that since this is a Department of the Air Force strategy, we'll talk a little bit about the 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 military importance of the Arctic. So um, one of our founders of the United States Air Force and certainly someone who is an outspoken uh, advocate for uh, for air power and for strategic power. 
was Billy Mitchell. Uh, and uh, Billy Mitchell has a quote that many of us who work Arctic issues are probably sick of hearing. But I think for the rest of the audience, it's actually really important is that way back in the 1930s, this air power advocate said that whoever holds Alaska will hold the world. And there is, uh, there is a, a really interesting kernel of truth inside that quote. And that is that there, uh, there's a special place for Alaska when you talk about power projection and defense of the homeland. So Alaska is an incredibly well-positioned base of operations for defending uh, the, the, uh, the approaches, the northern approaches to the United States. And this is why uh, so many of the intercepts that happen uh, when we go and intercept uh, a, uh, an adversary's aircraft uh, coming from the north, we do that with assets that are stationed in Alaska. But also, uh, in addition to it, its defensive use as a defensive base of operations, you could also think of military power that is stationed in, in the high north and especially in Alaska as being forward positioned in two major theaters, the Indo-Pacific and in Europe. And, uh, and in, in essence, you could conceivably do uh, power projection sorties out of Alaska to both of those areas. And, uh, and in fact, what we have seen in our wargaming is that it's an incredibly effective place to base uh, air operations out of. And so this gets into the, the reason why we are investing so much in places like where you're sitting there uh, uh, in Fairbanks and, and down in Anchorage and, and what, what we've got going on uh, with uh, with the extended operations at the at the range uh, outside of Ileson there. And there's so many things that we believe are important about that area. And we are plussing up the military power that is there. That came up not uh, that long ago in, uh, in the testimony during posture season, uh, as we were able to identify the, the ways that we are plussing up military power especially in Alaska. And it's because of that, the, the, the strategic importance and how, uh, how it's just a very unique spot for us going forward. Thank you. Perhaps I can call on General Likiri to uh, maybe pull a thread there or two. Sure, a absolutely. I, um, I think it's, it's a great place to pick up from both of those sets of comments, right? So General Hynote, well, I'll start with Secretary Siebold, talked about the threat vectors uh, that can come through the region. Uh, there, it is uh, um, no surprise to anyone who pays attention uh, that the radar, the early warning radars that are in the region are there for a reason, um, because of the uh, potential flight paths of uh, inbound ballistic missiles. Um, and then to General Hynote's point on other military operations in the region, uh, as we sort of already alluded to, uh, the nature or the, the, the sparse nature of resources uh, in that area to support military operations just brings space even more to the forefront here uh, in this region. And so um, the satellite command and control capabilities that are at Thule, uh, those are there because military operations are going to happen in the Arctic. And that means we're going to need to have satellite coverage in the Arctic, which means polar orbits. And so we needed an antenna station that would be able to talk to those satellites in a polar orbit. And so that's there for a reason and continues to be a key piece of our satellite control network. Um, I alluded to earlier, and then uh, Secretary Siebold also talked about this partnership with Norway uh, on communication. So let, let me expand on that just a little bit. Um, you know, as uh, all services do, we, we build a budget and we try to put as much capability uh, into that budget as possible. The reality is our budgets are, are finite. Uh, and so we've got to be able to, to be creative as we build those budgets. Sometimes, um, you know, we're able to pay for things completely on our own. And in other times, uh, we need to be able to, to rely on partners. And you know, it's one of Secretary of Defense's priorities to succeed through teamwork. Uh, and certainly Ms. Siebold's uh, organization is a key piece of that. Well, in the case of uh, a couple polar um, satellite communications payloads that we had been working on in the Space Force, um, they provide protected uh, satellite communications, so uh, jam resistant communications. Um, instead of putting those on our own satellite, instead of 
um, developing our own satellite, putting those, integrating those payloads onto that satellite and launching those satellites on our own, we were able to uh, have a good conversation with our uh, allies uh, in Norway. And they've agreed to, because they had two satellites that were going to go up on orbit along the time frame that we needed for these uh, SATCOM payloads, they are now going to integrate those payloads for us onto their um, satellites, they will launch them, and therefore we get uh, the benefit of a ride to space, if you will, and a host vehicle to put our payloads on. It's a uh, good way to strengthen the partnership. It's a good way to share costs, but also deliver capabilities that, uh, that we can both leverage. And so that's just a, a really good example, I think, uh, specific to partnerships, to the Arctic and to the space uh, region uh, of where it is that these, there's this confluence of events, if you will. And uh, Norway is just one great example of a, of a partner in the region. Well, thank, thank you very much for that reflection as well. Uh, it surely underscores a number of partnerships, but I can't help but think that it also reinforces the transatlantic alliance as well in a number of different ways. Uh, Church, let me go back to you for, for a, a question. And then uh, as people will note, I am also adding in questions from the audience. I'm trying to weave them into my comments and I'm gonna come back to several of those because we've got about a 10 minutes left and a long list of questions and I'll come back to including the issue of, of how we get to pay for all of this as well. Uh, Church, over to you. Well, thank you for that, Mike. And uh, this question I'd like to pose, uh, you know, Secretary Siebold had mentioned earlier about the, the, the mechanisms for collaboration, cooperation with security cooperation, security assistance with our allies and partners in the Arctic region. Um, today, of course, the, uh, we have the Arctic Security Forces Roundtable, which is a multinational gallery of the two-star level that's hosted in Europe, you know, co-hosted between the UCOM J5 and the Norwegian Defense uh, Planner. Uh, and that's conducted on an annual basis as kind of a forum for, you know, really for the hand to help missions that, that you know, multiple nations face in the Arctic region. The Arctic Coast Guard Forum uh, is a forum that involves all Arctic eight uh, nations to include Russia in this aspect of trying to figure out how to best work in the cooperative spaces that are available and that, that the United States has the permission to work through the Coast Guard, again, multinationally, including Russia in this construct. The Air Chiefs meeting you uh, fo focused on uh, on Secretary Siebold for this coming fall, uh, where the Arctic Chiefs, uh, the Air Chiefs who have an Arctic focus, gather principally with our European allies and of course Canadians and, and, and Americans. Could you see that uh, relaying from a, a, a gathering event to becoming a, you know, an occasional meeting as opposed to one that becomes institutionalized? And if so, how do you see the opportunity like where Russia has been able to work with our Coast Guard Forum, some sort of rapprochement and mill-to-mill -mill collaboration, again, permitting uh, the national security staff, permitting such conversation to happen. But could you see institutionalizing some sort of air and space dialogue on the Arctic region amongst our, at least our allies and partners, and then maybe someday in the future, our, our Russian uh, uh, colleagues as well. Your thoughts on that, Madam Secretary? Well, I think that, um, I think that just, to pull together this meeting in the fall, basically, I just started by talking to each of the Arctic Air Chiefs and um, testing the waters there. We had also had a, a meeting amongst the uh, Arctic attaches in Washington. And I think that um, our partners welcome the opportunity to, to work together. I think there's strong interest in uh, doing across the board security cooperation things not just exercises, but also um, looking at where we might do some research and development together, um, certainly where we might um, work together as Bill referred to um, on addressing some of our shortfalls um, and gaps in coverage uh, by collaborating in the, the space domain and areas that we might be able to work together. Um, I think that the, the reason I haven't like quite 100% committed to saying that it's going to be a, a routine or regular Arctic summit is that I think we first have to have the opportunity to have the first meeting and um, test the waters with these partners. But, but I believe that we are going to um, find great value in having a more routine engagement with these partners. And, and I think that We'll probably have opportunities to develop, you know, some um, sub working groups um, that will tackle some particular challenges that we're all facing um, in the region. So I think 
I think there's a lot to be learned. And certainly from my Coast Guard experience, I think we learned a lot um, from our partners, um, even just simple things like in Finland, if you go and see what they're doing with um, just the gear that they have, it is incredibly impressive. In fact, every time I was there, I was like, I would love to get that jacket <laughs> because their their gear is just really designed um, incredibly well to operate um, in those regions. So it could be as simple as that, but areas where we can leverage each other, each other's expertise, where we can maybe um, take advantage of our R&D money by putting it together on hard problems. I think that that those are all opportunities. So I think that there will be a, a longer term um, a, a more formal, uh, more routine um, gathering of, of these uh, air chiefs and space chiefs, if you will, to, to discuss Arctic issues in particular, um, in the particular particularities of Arctic um, challenges that we have. Regarding Russia, um, I think that uh, maybe way down the road, if the overall relationship improves, I think that to me, um, having come from, you know, this place where we did work with Russia because we had to, and we had very good um, operational working relationships. I mean, the Coast Guard really doesn't have an option not to work with these partners. Um, they share, you know, we share, uh, you know, worrying about oil in the water, people in the water in, in these areas. So I think that that there could come a time where we see it beneficial uh, to work together because we have common interests um, in the Arctic as Arctic nations. Um, and I certainly am aware that Russia would love to have security of the Arctic discussed in, in some forum and we just haven't um, had one yet, but I, I don't think it'll happen soon. I think there's a lot more um, I don't want to say there has to be a lot more improvement in the overall relationship before um, uh, that would happen, I think, but I wouldn't rule it out long term. Well, Madam Secretary, I thank you for that. I guess I have one short follow up to either for you or General Hyndot or General McCoury, uh, and then give the floor back to Dr. Schrager. And this is regarding, we've talked a little bit about the international collaborators, partners, allies. As you look across the interagency, uh, what are some aspects with your federal partners, you know, like our friends in the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, National Weather Service, um, other element, other partners, the Department of Homeland Security, um, that, that, that can help work with you in implementing your strategy to help prepare for support the Department of Defense's Arctic strategy? Any thoughts, again, on, on the role of federal partners uh, in, in your implementation endeavors? And I'll leave it open for all three of you to respond to as you would like. I just would just real quickly say that I think that we have the opportunity to learn from some of those relationships that the other agencies have. I would I would note that Homeland Security, for instance, has very, very good relationship with um, the indigenous uh, uh, people in the region. And um, and certainly our Canadian partners are a great example as as well. And, and it's a, and these issues are across their interagency as well. So I think I think we can learn through dialogue with the interagency and how they're handling things. That would be my perspective. The one I would add um, for what it's worth is we certainly uh, enjoy a good partnership with NOAA uh, today um, in the environmental monitoring space. We, we have some satellites that we operate that do environmental monitoring. NOAA has some that they operate, and we try to do those in a complementary fashion, if you will, uh, to provide the best uh, coverage um, for the Arctic region as well as others. But uh, it's a good partnership with NOAA, and it's, it's certainly an important thing in that region. Mike, let me give the floor back to you. I know we're running really tight on time. Thank you, Madam Secretary General Lacourie, for your reflections. Thank, thank you, Church. Uh, yeah, as always, uh, we, we have a robust discussion here, so we, we, we should explore doing this again. I, there's a question about uh, costs, right? You, you have each talked uh, eloquently about the way in which you've leveraged inside the agency, but also with partners and, and allies. So this question, let me just read it verbatim and answer it, whomever may want to be best positioned to answer this one. But so the Air Force's Arctic strategy didn't share information on cost estimates tied to the goals it laid out. Does the service now have an overarching figure showing how much officials are looking to spend to realize those goals? 
or more details about what levels of investment are needed to implement this strategy? Tough question to answer as targets change, literally and figuratively, I understand. Dr. Strega, I will take a very short uh, swing at that one. And, uh, and, and just to say, in many cases, it's difficult to separate out what investments you have uh, for a particular region, especially when you're a global air force or a global space force. But, uh, but our latest estimates are that we're spending a pretty decent amount, certainly out of the Department of the Air Force's budget on things that are clearly related to Arctic security, Arctic operations. And that number is in the neighborhood of $6 billion now. And we know there is going to be a, uh, an effort going forward to do things like modernize the North Warding system. Uh, we, we've put that off for too long. So we know that we're gonna have to work with our partners in Canada to be able to do that. And we also see uh, ways of getting synergy between the investments that our allies and partners are making in things they're doing, doing as well. But I think it's important that the American people know it's not like we're not spending a decent amount of money uh, up in the Arctic because there's a decent, a pretty, pretty good amount that's going up there right now. I would just echo what General Hynote said, um, specific to our two services and the um, scope with which we support, right? It, it, we have a global perspective uh, in both services. The, the, the satellites that we have on orbit today are providing capabilities certainly to the Arctic region, but as orbits go, um, they're also providing capabilities to our operations in, in other air areas and regions. But to the point of the question and the example that I had given previously, we, we're trying to do what we can to maximize the resources that we're able to deliver to this region and others. Um, through partnerships, uh, as well as our own uh, individual budget. In some cases, we spend some in our budget and an, a partner spends in their budget as well. And so it's a cost sharing uh, side of things, but ultimately delivering more capability than either of us could do on our own. Thank you for that. Uh, we've got, well, we've run out of time. Obviously, let me let me just ask my friends in the studio if we can buy another minute or two. I have one more question, and unless they say no to me on the chat box, I'm just going to ask that one last question. Uh, but but they certainly have the right to overrule and pull the plug. Uh, th there's a question, uh, a number of questions about infrastructure. So as quickly as we possibly can, uh, with the changing environment, there are different pressures now on infrastructure. We knew really well how to build on permafrost. We don't know how well to build yet on thawing permafrost. There are implications for environmental uh, change, uh, climate change and its impact on infrastructure. Uh, how, how are our infrastructures in the North, particularly Alaska, poised to deal with the, the new climate regimes we are seeing? And will new facilities and sites need to be revitalized, reimagined, rebuilt? There's some very specific questions about IELTS and Air Force Base and the touchiness there, of course, is because we have the F-35s there. So I guess to round out that question, provide for us just a peek, a window into the ways in which the, the Air Force is thinking about future infrastructure and how you will deal with this knowing full well, you're just gonna get more mission sets to do all the things you just said you, you need to do. Yeah, Dr. Strega, that is a major question. And uh, I'll just say, uh, like so many parts of our infrastructure all around the world, the challenge of climate change is going to require us to think differently about how we construct and how we maintain infrastructure. That will 100% be true in the high north. We are working closely with, uh, with research entities, including the Army's Coal Region uh, Research and Engineering Lab, CREL, as well as many of the universities. And frankly, this is an area where uh, I would like to make an appeal to the academic world. This is something in the, in the engineering realm that we don't 100% understand yet, but the idea of how do you construct on thawing permafrost is going to be a key part of our infrastructure question going forward. And it's ripe for great research for some uh, aspiring uh, graduate students and undergraduate students and professors out there. We would love to partner with you on that. So much more to follow. General, I have a feeling you're gonna get a flood of uh, 
offers coming in and, and we can certainly help with that as well. There's, there's a great interest in that. General LeCurie or, or Secretary Seabolt, your thoughts on that? I, I think General Hino hit, hit it on the head. Um, you know, in, in many cases for us as a new service, um, the, uh, the U.S. Air Force is, is the uh, partner that we work with on infrastructure on the ground uh, type thing. But I guess I, what I would highlight, while certainly everything that he just said is true and, and uh, continuing to be able to build in that area and in the face of melting permafrost will be important. That also highlights the continued importance of being able to deliver capability from on orbit um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the region itself as well. Thank you. Secretary Seabolt, final reflections there. I just uh, would just tell just a funny story. When I was in Finland and um, we went to their small boat stations, they actually had a floating uh, boat station which at the time I thought, well, this is incredibly clever because you know, with climate change, uh, it'll allow them to move those boat stations as, as things change. I later discovered the actual reason for the floating boat station was because the tax structure within Finland and how the government entities got taxed. Um, so actually it was for a whole different purpose, but, but it also just speaks to you know, the kind of innovation which may seem simple um, that, that we may need to, um, and we're going to have to innovate as, as we look at how to make these changes and try to do them in a way that is cost effective and, and will stand the test of time because um, the region is only going to become more accessible. So it just makes it even more important that um, we think through this and make those investments because um, we've got to not only work with our allies and partners, but we've got to defend the homeland. And um, that's a great place to be, to do it um, in Alaska. So, but anyway, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Church, let me give you just a couple of seconds left because I know we've gone way over just your final thoughts and then I'll do a quick wrap. Well, thank you, Mike. And uh, first of all, for your high note, uh, I know there's a number of communities uh, within the research world, um, including ours at the Argument Awareness Center's focus on Arctic environmental change to include uh, uh, Arctic uh, Infrastructure and Facilities Environmental Change Risk Index uh, project that we're uh, underway in uh, just for the last several months trying to accomplish for the US Coast Guard. I know that's just one small example, but characterizing the Arctic and, and, and being able to leverage the Arctic uh, research community for innovation is gonna be critical going forward. And I know that the community is ready, willing and able to support the, the operation needs, operational needs of both the US Air Force and the US Space Force. So. I can put that down as a marker for further for follow-up. I do know that I'm just, our little center is one of many that's trying to tackle this problem at both at large and small scale, fine scale. So just put that out. I thank each of you distinguished leaders and, and thank you for your service, your leadership and your contributions to today's discussion. Meaningful, important, timely, and we certainly would like to try to pull these threads further forward in, in the coming dialogue. I'll move the floor back to Dr. Schrager and thank you again, distinguished leaders. We're grateful for your time, the gift of your time. Church, thank you for the, <clears throat> excuse me, for the comments and, and the partnership. Uh, let me thank uh, all, all of our friends out there watching and, and participating. I, again, apologize for not getting to the scores of questions. Just, just tells us uh, this is a great subject with great presenters uh, and so very timely. I, I wanna thank our friends at the studio uh, for the last year and a half, our Wilson team has put the Wilson Center on their back and has allowed us to do our work like this remotely and very creatively. So thank you to Jerry Thompson and John Tyler and Treon Burgess and the entire team there. Without them, I can't do this work and we can't get this great information out uh, to the world. Uh, Secretary Seabolt, uh, I know you've got a thing or two on your schedule going on and I wanna thank you for taking an hour plus with us today. This is important and it's wonderful for us to hear from you. And I wanna thank the Air Force and Space Force for coming forward and doing a one-year check-in on a strategy that is being worked. I just apologize, we haven't gotten to all those pieces yet, but I would like to do so. So let me thank you all. It's important to our nation. It's important to our allies. It's important to the future of the Arctic. So Secretary Siebold, thank you very much. Uh, General LeCurie, General Hynote, I want to thank you for, for the leadership, but also the candor. And you've provided for us a most meaningful peek into what is happening 
uh, with your branch of service, your efforts on our behalf, and how we can link Alaska to the Arctic to our global efforts as a country and with our allies. This was meaningful. Please do not underestimate the power of what you have shared with us today. Uh, so I wanna look forward to do that. And Ambassador Green, Mark, thank you for the support of the Polar Institute. Uh, Secretary Seaboat, you mentioned the Antarctic, us and the Polar Institute, we do think bipolar. So we, we may have to come back and do a, do a, a show on the Antarctic as well. But uh, Ambassador Green, thank you for the support and for opening this up. To everyone who has watched, I wanna thank you once again for following us, nearly 600 people. Uh, and thank you for the support of our center. I hope this was helpful, beneficial for all involved. I want you all to have a very wonderful rest of your morning, your afternoon, or your evening, and I'll look forward just to doing it again. Thank you very much for your time.